Black on white pottery is surprisingly scarce in ancient pottery worldwide. If you look at ancient pottery in different cultures around the world that made pottery back in, you know, centuries ago, you find lots of, uh, you know, textured ware. You find lots of red on browns. You find black on browns or black on tan, but black on white pottery is not so common. Even in the Americas, if you look in Mesoamerica and Peru and uh, along the east coast of the United States and these other places that had long and elaborate pottery traditions, you just don't see a lot of black on white pottery. The Southwest stands out as a place where they made a lot of black and white pottery back in the day, where black and white pottery was apparently very important, something valued in this area. Uh, so just to run through some of the black on white pottery types that we have here in the Southwest. And these are not uh, specific types because archeologists will make endless numbers of types. These are traditions, these are uh, technological traditions. So I've kind of grouped them into broad categories. So you've got, first of all, Anazazi organic painted black on white. This is the most common one, the types you would see up at Mesa Verde, the kind that is done by many pottery replicators in the Southwest. And then there's its lesser known brother, Anazazi mineral painted black on white. This is hardly ever replicated, but like Cibola whitewares are like that. Uh, you've got your White Mountain Redware glaze painted black on white. Now you think White Mountain Redware is red, but uh, there are often white areas, maybe the insides of bowls or the tops of jars. They're white slipped areas on White Mountain Redware. And these are often black paint on top of a white background. And these are usually a, a glaze based paint. So a whole different technology, a whole different sort of painting than you would find on your standard Anazazi mineral painted black on white. Now you've got a really rare polychrome down in Tucson area, a whole con polychrome called Rincon polychrome. And Rincon polychrome includes black mineral paint on a white background. And then you've got your whole Mogollon oxidized organic painted pottery which would include things, well, it includes a lot of black on red, so we're not gonna talk about because we're focusing on black on whites, but it also includes things like Pinto polychrome and Gila polychrome and Tonto polychrome, all those Salado types that the main decorated area is black designs on a white background. Uh, and then there's types that are kind of black on white, but uh, the background color is not so white. It's more of a cream or a buff color. So uh, black on cream, for example. And in that area, you might include Baba Kamari polychrome from Southern Arizona, and all those Casas Grandes polychromes from Northern Chihuahua, like Ramos and those other ones that are kind of black on white-ish. Uh, and then you've got Mogollon mineral painted black on white pottery. These would include things like Chupadero black on white, and of course, your Membrus black on white, because they're Mogollon mineral painted pottery. In the course of this talk, I'm gonna talk about recreating prehistoric black on white pottery around the Southwest. But in the end, I kind of want to identify and generate some ideas about how specifically how membrous black on white pottery was made. So that's kind of our focus, our end goal. So to start with, let's talk about what we know about membrous black on white pottery, things that would help us to recreate it. First of all, that white background is a white clay slip. And then that black mineral paint is painted on top of that white slip. And we know that it's a reduced iron paint. That is, it was actually red when they painted it on and then it was fired in such a way that that iron reduced to black. And we can know that easily because first of all, you often see members pottery where there's just a small area that's turned red or sometimes the whole pot, the designs are red. Also, you can take those sherds of members black on white pottery, throw it in an electric kiln and it'll turn red. So that tells you that it is in fact reduced iron paint. Uh, other things we know about it is that firing temperatures were between 800 and 850 degrees Celsius. So that gives us a, a temperature target to aim ourselves at as we try to recreate it. Uh, so not extremely hot, but you know, maybe on the higher end of hot in prehistoric pottery from the Southwest. And the other important thing to know about it is that no kiln features have been found in members country. So we haven't found any evidence of surface firings, uh, which would be harder to locate. But more importantly, we haven't found any evidence of trench kilns, which are a little more permanent, a little more easy to find in the archeological record. 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about early replication efforts here in the Southwest. Now, nobody really knows the full history of pottery replication in the Southwest. How could anyone ever know? You know, there's always that guy that, you know, down the street that's working on maybe trying to recreate ancient pottery in his garage on weekends. And he's just working alone and trying to figure it out. Unless he writes a book about what he's discovered or, or starts selling his pots at a, you know, a large venue like Mesa Verde National Park, uh, most of us will never hear of that guy. And a lot of those kind of people have existed over the years. Uh, that we don't know about. So there's no way I can completely cover the history of, you know, black on white pottery replication. But I'm going to hit the high points, or at least the people we know something about. So I'm going to start earliest and work forward. John Olson started trying to recreate Anazazi pottery back in the 70s. And he kind of focused on his area where he lived, which was the northwestern Anazazi traditions. You know, he's from southern Utah, and, and kind of that's been the main area he's focused on. Not that he hasn't made other things. John's made Salado polychromes and just all kinds of things over the years. Uh, but that's been his main focus. So John's black paint, both organic and mineral, may predate many of these other potters I'm going to talk about here. He certainly gave me the help I needed in figuring out how to fire Salado oxidized organic paint pottery. It's an interesting point of history to me that pot hunting is often the mother of replication. Uh, in many cases, it's often the pot hunters, the artifact collectors, that become the replicators. There was a recent lecture done at the University of Arizona about how the Mata Ortiz pottery tradition evolved out of the pot hunting that was going on there back in the 60s and 70s. And this is true also in Northern Arizona. So back in the 70s, there was a lot of pot hunting activity going on in and around Snowflake, Arizona. This guy named Reed Wasson, who was one of those pot hunters, began recreating prehistoric pottery of that area. Things like Cibola Whitewares and White Mountain Redwares. And I'm told he was a really talented, resourceful artist who made many important discoveries. He also taught a lot of other people the things he was learning about recreating these potteries. And so one of those people that learned from Reed Wasson was Michael Hawley. Michael Hawley started out making these Cibola potteries from the Snowflake area. But he ended up becoming famous for recreating Sikyatki polychrome, an ancient Hopi type. And so Michael Hawley's kind of well known, Reed Wasson less so. But I'm told from several sources that this Reed Wasson was an important figure in discovering things that were then passed on to others. Reed Wasson went missing in December of 2000 and his body was never discovered. And Michael Hawley passed away in April of 2012. So neither of these guys are available to answer questions about how they achieved mineral black, but they both did. I've been told that Hawley fired his black on white pottery in a hole in the ground and then smothered it. But I've never even seen any of these pots. The only Hawley pot I've ever seen that's black on white is painted with a glaze based paint. So I just really have nothing to base that on. Lead-based glaze paint is interesting stuff. The lead in the paint acts as a fixative. That is, it attaches that paint to the pot. So most mineral paints have to have clay added to them to make them stick to the pot and not wipe off after firing. But these glaze paints don't have to have that because as that glaze melts, it fuses with the clay underneath and that paint becomes permanent. But the lead in the paint leaves telltale signs that it was used. So if you look at this holly pot right here, look at the black paint. You see these white areas here? You see these little areas where it's just kind of a little bit white in places? This is like some oxidation that takes place on that lead paint. You'll see the same thing on prehistoric White Mountain Redwares a lot of times. A lot of these prehistoric glaze paints will get these little areas where they turn white like this. It's some kind of oxidation on the lead. Now. Sikyaki Polychrome didn't have lead-based glaze paint. But here, I think Holly is taking that technology that he learned down there in Snowflake, making White Mountain Redwares, and he's brought this up to Hopi to create these Sikyaki Polychromes, which is not accurate. And, you know, there's good reasons to do that. Like I said, if you use that lead in it, it makes a good fixative. It makes that paint bind to the clay underneath. If you watch that video on YouTube about Holly and his Sikyatki polychrome, 
he makes this comment about, you know, he had no other living potters to help him, which is, of course, nonsense. He said right before that, that he was an adopted member of the Hopi Tobacco Clan. Certainly he would have had potters in the Hopi Tobacco Clan who were living potters who could have helped him. Not to mention Reed Wasson, which I've heard from multiple sources he learned from back in Snowflake. So when he says no living potters to help him, you know, it's kind of one of those things that's like true from a certain point of view, like Obi-Wan Kenobi told Luke Skywalker, right? I mean, it's true from a certain point of view in that there was no living potters who had made Sikyaki polychrome before or something like that. This is another thing about replicators, though, when you look at the history of pottery replication. They love telling people that they're completely self-taught, even when they're not. And you'll see this crop up over and over again. Oh, I'm self-taught. And then later you find out, you know, they learned from somebody else. Or at least they won't say who they learned from. I think that Holly probably got the black glaze paint on his White Mountain Redwares pretty close to spot on from the pictures I've seen. Now, I've heard that he may have produced black reduced iron paint, but I've yet to see a photo of any of these pots. The Crow Canyon Kiln Conferences started in 1991. Their goal was said to be, by combining archaeological knowledge gained from recent excavation of kiln features with insight experiences of potters and replicators, the Kiln Conference provides a unique setting for conducting experiments in understanding ancestral Pueblo firing technology. So in short, they were trying to figure out how trench kilns were used to create Anazazi black on white pottery. The replicator who contributed the most to these conferences was Clint Swink. It has been reported that he accomplished over a hundred test firings before the first kiln conference. And Swink's paper, Limited Oxidation Firing of Organic Painted Pottery in Anazazi Style Trench Kilns, was published in 1993 in Pottery Southwest, really nailed down that technique for firing organic painted black on white pottery. This info inspired a whole generation of replicators to create Mesa Verde black on white pottery. A lot of the people at the Kiln Conference learned how to make Mesa Verde style black on white pottery either directly from Clint Swink or from Clint Swink's book. If we were to look at the entire body of southwestern black on white replica pottery that has been produced in the last 50 years, the vast majority of that replica pottery is organic painted Mesa Verde style black on white fired in a trench kiln, just like Swink wrote about in his book. And the reason for that is that these archaeologists and potters involved in these early kiln conferences did such a great job of nailing down the process. It's amusing to me the amount of effort that has gone into trying to disprove Swink's four-step trench kiln firing process when at the end of the day or the end of the conference in this case we will be opening up and removing our pots from a trench kiln fired with Swink's four-step process. Because in spite of the criticisms everyone knows that it works remarkably well for producing authentic looking black on white pottery. I personally know very little about trench kiln firings. I have never ever done or even been involved with a trench kiln. I've watched a few from a distance at the kiln conference. But Kelly Magleby, who does have experience with these, tells me that this method of firing will produce reduced iron paint, which honestly makes sense to me. I just have no experience, can't speak for it myself. But to me, making reduced iron painted pottery in a trench kiln raises the following two questions. If the trench kiln works so well for reduced iron paint, then why do people continue to make unauthentic organic painted members replicas? And two, how did the members potters fire since there have been no trench kills found in members country? Paul and Laurel Thornburg began replicating prehistoric southwestern ceramics in 1987. Now if you look at their Arizona highway spread from August of 1989, you will see that they were already doing convincing replicas of white mountain polychromes, salado polychromes, and members black on white at that time. So the question is, who did they learn from? I mean, I tend to think with so many diverse pottery types under their belt in just two years of work that they must have learned from somebody else and not developed all of those paint technologies on their own within a two year period of time. The truth is we may never know, 
because they don't share a lot of information with people. Like a lot of replica potters, maybe they're self-taught. But one thing about the Thornburgs is they made excellent membrous replicas without using a trench kiln. They fired in a process they call an earthen tunnel. Now this is basically just a primitive convection kiln. It can be dug into the bank of an arroyo, hence the name earthen tunnel. But I think in most cases they were firing in an adobe kiln in their backyard. So this is one way that you can get reduced iron black painted pottery. I personally think it's unlikely that this is how the members potters were doing it, but I could be wrong and the results for this method speak for themselves. The area around Mata Ortiz, Chihuahua, like Snowflake, Arizona, was a hot spot for pot hunting in the 1970s. But finding nice, sellable pots in the ruins can take a lot of work and searching. And after a while, the ruins start getting played out, pretty picked over, like most of the good pots are gone. At this point, some of the more artistic pot hunters might think that they could make pots easier than digging up pots. Interestingly, this seems to be what happened in both Snowflake and Mata Ortiz. Reed Wasson was that man in Snowflake, and Juan Quezada was the guy in Mata Ortiz. To be fair, I should point out that Juan maintains that he was not involved in pot hunting, and I take him at his word. Yet, he had to have been inspired, at least in part, by the money he saw others making with artifacts. And his early pots were unsigned fakes, meant to capture some of that artifact business. Again, that completely self-taught story comes up. In more than one person in Mata Ortiz, there is no way that several people in the same little town learned pottery on their own with no outside help, independently. To me, the use of pookies and various other technical aspects of Mata Ortiz pottery seems to point to Juan having been informed about either the Pueblo pottery of New Mexico or Tarahumara pottery that's made in his own state of Chihuahua. The pottery replicators of Mata Ortiz were fortunate because there were manganese mines very near Mata Ortiz. I have been told that the recipe for Mata Ortiz black mineral paint contains manganese dioxide, copper carbonate, and clay. And they do achieve a really nice, solid mineral black. Now, over the years, Mata Ortiz pottery has evolved more towards art and away from replicas. But that was the origin of the craft there. Casas Grandes mineral paint is manganese based, as is Baba Kamari polychrome, Rincon polychrome, and just about any other oxidized black mineral paint. But manganese doesn't work well in a reduction atmosphere. If it's not oxidized well, that manganese will turn brown instead of black. The other thing to keep in mind is that a true white clay slip, one that stays white in an oxidation fire, is extremely rare. Most white clays will turn cream or buff in an oxidation fire. So these two facts, black manganese can't be reduced and a true white clay cannot be oxidized, will help to answer a lot of questions about prehistoric pottery. So let's examine some prehistoric pottery examples and talk about the atmosphere they were fired in. So here we have an example of Tularosa black on white, classic. The white slip tells us it was fired in a reduction atmosphere. And that black mineral paint in a reduction atmosphere tells us it's reduced iron. Here's a very different example, St. John's black on red, but it is the redware uh, equivalent of Tularosa made by the same people, made in the same villages with slightly different techniques, right? So let's run this one by. Red slip tells us it was fired in an oxidation atmosphere, right? But the black paint in this case tells us it's manganese based paint, whereas the Tularosa was painted with red iron oxide. The St. John's had to be painted with a completely different recipe, manganese based black paint. Okay. Let's go farther south now and look at some Ramos polychrome from Casas Grandes. The red and the cream colors tell us that this was fired in an oxidation atmosphere. But look at that black mineral paint. It must be manganese-based black mineral paint. Okay, now let's talk about membrous. This is classic membrous black on white. That white slip tells us it was fired in a reduction atmosphere. The 
black mineral paint therefore must be reduced iron. Okay, Bob Kamari Polychrome. Look at that creamy color of that background and those red designs. That tells us this was fired in an oxidation atmosphere. So that black mineral paint must be manganese based. Okay, let me throw you a curveball now that you've got it all figured out. Pinedale Polychrome. Red slip tells us oxidation firing. But that glaze based paint is not manganese based. It's mostly copper and lead with just a little bit of manganese in it. Okay, now here's the whiteware version, right? This was, the last one was Pinedale Poly. This is Pinedale Black on White. This is the same people making it, uh, but a whiteware, okay? The white slip shows it was fired in a reduction atmosphere, but the paint, same recipe as the redware. The black glaze works the same in any atmosphere. Interesting, isn't it? So just about any black mineral paint you see on pottery with a bright white slip is reduced iron. That would include most Cibola whitewares, members black on white, Socorro, Chupadero. Of course, this is easily proved by refiring Assured in an electric kiln, which will make that paint turn red if it is in fact reduced iron. But keep in mind, there's no hard fast rules. There are exceptions to all these. And I'm not saying that these are hard fast rules, but, but they're general rules and they're usually right. I learned about mineral paints from Paul Thornburg. Yeah, I'm not totally self-taught like a lot of people. I grew up in a country rich in manganese and the native pottery in that area has no bright white slips. They're all kind of cream colored. So I was perfectly happy creating oxidized pottery with my manganese paints. I also spent about 30 years trying to figure out Salado polychromes, which were also made in my area, which is an oxidized organic painted pottery. So those were my two black paints for a long time. Just that manganese based black and the Salado polychrome organic blacks. But recently I've become interested in some other areas. So the first one, white mountain polychrome. Uh, that is, you know, you can paint that with a manganese based paint and it works. But most of that white mountain polychrome was painted with a glaze paint, which is a lot different. So just briefly, because this talk isn't about glaze paint, the way I got this done is to pre-roast that galena. So galena is lead ore. Uh, and you don't just add galena to your copper carbonates to make that glaze paint. You have to take that ground galena, you have to roast it and stir it and let it oxidize. And that burns out some of that sulfur, turns it from lead sulfate into lead oxide, and then put it in your paint. You're gonna get a lot better success getting that glaze in it. The other ones I've been interested in in the last couple years is Cibola whitewares like the Tularosa and the Reserve black on white and those members black on whites. Now those require that red reduced iron paint and that's really been a tough one for me to crack. I have a lot of experience with red paint recipes. You know, I've made a lot of Mogion red on browns, even some Hoacom red on buffs. Uh, red paint is something I can do and that's, that's easy. That's just some red iron oxide mixed with red clay. Uh, about two thirds red iron oxide and about one third clay. Uh, now I know from experience firing with these red iron paints that if I fire it hot enough, say over 800 degrees Celsius, something like that, even in a surface fire with lots of oxygen flow, those reds will turn black. When you open that up and start pulling pots out, they will be black and then they will slowly turn red as the pot cools. So I can reduce red iron oxide I mean, that's easy. I've been doing that for years. Uh, the real secret is how to keep it from turning red as it cools. You've got to somehow remove it from oxygen. So uh, the experiments I've been doing recently, uh, I've fired in a shallow pit. Now, like I said, uh, you know, I'm hesitant to use a trench kiln because they weren't found in that area. But a shallow pit, I think, could work. Uh, and then I use a lot of cover shirts over the top. The reason is um, the smothering material, the earth, uh, it has a lot of organic matter in it, and I don't want that, you know, little roots, leaves, uh, or just, you know, general organic matter in the earth. I don't want that carbonizing when it gets on top of the pot. So by covering it up good with cover shirts, that allows me to pile that earth over it without that earth coming in contact with the hot pots. And I mean hot. They're super hot at this point. The other thing I'm curious about trying is pull and smother. So a friend of mine who collects prehistoric pottery showed me some of his members' bowls. And even though they're reduced nice and black on the inside, places where they've slopped some of that red paint on the outside of the bowl, 
turn bright red. So to me, that seems to indicate that these pots were smothered just by placing them upside down on the ground. Therefore, the outside was able to oxidize. So I'm curious about firing a bowl, nice and hot, in a fire, and then just pulling it out real quick, setting it face down on the ground, maybe putting a little dirt around it to keep the oxygen out, which I think is kind of how they were doing with the uh, smudged ware as well, which is another Mogollon tradition. So I'm gonna try this at the Kiln Conference this year. I'm gonna try uh, smothering over cover sherds, and I'm gonna try pull and smother as well, and we'll see how that works out. So I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing your ideas about how you would go about creating membrous black on white reduced iron paint. Reduced iron paint is one of the last major unresolved questions in Southwest pottery replication. Hopefully the Southwest Kiln Conference can do for this question what it did for organic paint black on white pottery back in the 90s.